for great education for everyone, for a national development can never be overemphasized. A lot of people have said it, a lot of people have tested, the researchers keep on persistent basis tell us that if we must get ahead of times, we must get ourselves educated, not just in the classroom, but, but the practical form of it, very important, which is why we keep wondering, our tertiary institutions are supposed to provide us not just the cognitive aspect of knowledge, but very importantly, the psychomotor, which will inver in her, in, in, invariably translate to technicalities, production, and of course, uh, increasing our productivity in Nigeria. All right, the program is Weekend Deal, and my name is Elizabeth. And I'm wondering, do you understand that rather than going up, we are actually stepping backwards with our tertiary institution? But not to worry. At the end of today, we'll be able to prefer solutions as to how we will be able to strengthen our tertiary institutions. A whole lot of things will be happening today. Again, we'll be moving around, especially to enjoy the excitement of students as they have resumed schools. I am particularly excited as a mother because my children have gone back to school. All right, we don't have much ado about everything. We he stretched the background out. Stay with us. In the words of Malcolm X, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Nigeria today is going through challenging times as it took the intervention of the judiciary to afford students the opportunity to resume classes. The bottom line, is that the imperatives to strengthen tertiary education in Nigeria cannot be overemphasized. Polytechnics and colleges of education are pivotal in galvanizing Nigeria's education sector to greater heights. These phases of education provide the technical manpower that drive the engine of growth towards attaining technological and manpower needs in critical sectors of the economy. It is no news that products or graduates from polytechnics and colleges of education excel more in practical aspects of job specification compared to their university counterparts. Despite the striking nature of this asset, employers of labor discriminate against graduates from polytechnics and colleges of education such that they have problems with career progression in public service. They often find it difficult to rise above a certain cadre in the workforce or organizational organogram. While demand in acquiring university education far outstrips supply, the same picture cannot be painted for candidates seeking admissions into polytechnics and colleges of education. Why are students not favorably disposed to attend these schools? Can't they attend polytechnics and colleges of education as a stepping stone to greater heights? Incentives, mentoring, Improved orientation and role modeling can help curtail or reverse the unfavorable attitude or perception students have to embracing education in our polytechnics and colleges of education. Policymakers, administrators, and relevant stakeholders should smoothen the synergy and ease the path to transit from one tertiary education to another. This would ease the burden on the demand to acquire university education at all costs. We can deal today beams her searchlight on strengthening tertiary education in Nigeria, seeking for ways out of the challenges confronting the education sector. 
All right, the focus again is strengthening our tertiary institution, making them be the best. And yesterday when we talked, I did mention that we have quite a high number of tertiary institutions. And one of them is the Polytechnic. I think it was about 59 of them when we did the headcount. You and I, yes, we did it. And um, the Polytechnic, a lot of people keep asking, why were they established? Most of us just think, okay, we need to go to university, we need to go to the higher institution. If we can't get jump, or perhaps the closest to our house is the polytechnic, so we go to the polytechnic. But I keep asking, do we understand the core mandate of the polytechnics? And that is a question Ijoma will answer. Let's go and join her. The Nigerian tertiary education system, including polytechnics, have seen countless multifaceted problems in recent times. So, in the bid to identify these problems and to profile solutions, I spoke to Chief Simon Nwate, Rector City Polytechnic Duse Alahaji, here in Abuja, to x-ray some of the issues affecting the polytechnic arm of Nigeria's higher education system. First, revisiting the purpose of establishing polytechnics in the Nigeria tertiary education system. Purpose of uh, polytechnic education, based on the act, was to train people practically and then provide them with skills that they can be very useful, not only to the workplace, but to the whole society. So that was the purpose, original purpose of polytechnic education, but somehow there is a digression because the system in Nigeria in terms of value is that the graduate is better than the polytechnic. So you even see those who have got ND, instead of continuing to do HND, they are looking for a way to run a way to enter the university. That's the problem. And when they come to the workplace, promotions, considerations, pathway size of office and whatever, Priority is on the degree and not on the HND. Secondly, to further draw attention to the potentials polytechnic education possesses if tactfully redirected to purpose. Uh, it has to be two ways. One, and most importantly from government. Because you don't create a system and you don't prepare for the products of the system. That's what is happening in Nigeria. If you go to somewhere like China, they are converting universities now to polytechnics. Instead of from, we, we are converting polytechnics to universities because they have discovered. And they now know that what matters now is the skill and not the certificate. So the first thing government has to do is to begin to equalize the system and begin to give recognition that what Nigeria wants is skills. And, uh, but if government now begins to redirect, to say, look, we are emphasizing based on skill. We are assessing and evaluating you based on skill. And we are giving you your remuneration based on skill. You now discover that people will no longer think of, uh, uh, because you got a, a first class, you will get a better remuneration than somebody who has skill. Once government changes that philosophy, people will adapt. Then at the level of society, we need sensitization. Because the society just be ah, if you can get a degree, you are good to go. But if society can be sensitized, enlightened to say, look, what survives society, industrialized societies today is skill and not certificate. And thirdly, how to strengthen the capacities of polytechnics in Nigeria for a sustainable skills-driven economy through equal recognition of each certification with other tertiary arms of education. There are different aspects of this capacity. You can talk of the financial capacity, you can talk of the technical capacity, administrative capacity, and all that. From any level of capacity at all, there is need for improvement. The key is proper funding, because even the skills you are going to teach, you will need some equipment to teach. You have to be there. So, to improve capacity, and to make polytechnics contribute its own quota to the economy, first of all, they have to be properly funded. Then there is need for also technical support, training. Government should design a way 
to improve the capacity of those who are doing it. Not necessarily going to send them to BB schools, but organize seminars, workshops, and then program that will continue to focus those who are involved uh, in polytechnic education on the, 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 the objective of polytechnic education. With all that has been said, our takeaways are polytechnics in Nigeria should go back to its core mandate, and that is to train technologists and technicians on courses relevant to the needs and aspirations of a developing society like ours that is in dear need of innovations and technological advancement. All right, uh, now we have looked at the core mandates of a polytechnics. It's interesting to see if most of the polytechnics or all of the polytechnics are you know, working in synergy with what, that's, what that has been sell, spelled out for all of them. Now, let's take a um, you know, sample view of some of them beginning with the polytechnic of Ibadan. Are they following the core mandate? NT Ibadan will answer that question. Undoubtedly, technical education is key to technological growth and development of any country. For this reason, polytechnic education is established to make skilled manpowers available in all spheres of life. I'm a product of polytechnic system. I spent a total of uh, eight semesters within the polytechnic system. And uh, within the university system, I spent 13 semesters three semesters for a master's and uh, ten semesters for a degree program, law. But the mass communication that I read at the Polytechnic in Badon, I'm going to say Polytechnic now, Monsuda Bella Polytechnic. At the end of my first year as a student, I went for attachment. I came back practically a journalist because I was only writing, writing stories. So by the time I finished my first two years, I was good to go. I was doing everything I was that, uh, that established staff were doing then. Regrettably, the polytechnics meant to provide technical education has been greatly undermined and undervalued in Nigeria. Remember in the 60s, 70s, even up to 90s, the best brain in technical knowledge and industries are from polytechnics, not elsewhere. Because they are supposed to supply what is missing, but today we still have a lot of them doing their best. From time immemorial, discrimination against those who pass through the polytechnic system of education has always generated eternal debate. And this continues to raise lots of questions as to whether the polytechnic education has outlived its usefulness and therefore should be scrapped. Does government really value the importance of technical education to national development? Where we are supposed to focus and develop, we have not been doing that. And like I said, I told somebody, Nigeria is a major exporter of petroleum. Ironically, we are also a major importer. So that means we are not focused in this country. Beyond discrimination, there's also concern over the quality of graduates being churned out in recent times. Why some believe that there is a sharp drop in quality. Others feel products of polytechnics are still performing brilliantly wherever they find themselves. I went to a class yesterday and I was teaching them. You know what they told me? You have done enough, sir. Give us test. I said, what have you done? So this shift in emphasis, you know, the society is so materialistic now that nobody wants to work. It's not the school. The school is giving the best. But you also have to face the challenges of number. In my day, we are just uh, 23 in the class. Now we have more than 2,000. What does the present crops of students feel about the system, considering the fact that products of polytechnic education are marginalized and undervalued in Nigeria? How proud are they to be in the system? Three years ago, I used to be very, very ashamed. I used to feel inferior when I am in the midst of my colleagues who are in the university. It's just a status or name or something. I'm, st I'm even better. I'm proud of the school I went to because I'm, I'm more better than those 
who even go to university and know that. We all know that in this country they respect um, BSc more than HND certificate, so whereas there are a lot of things that HND older would do that is far better than what BSc older would do in terms of practical aspects. Polytechnics in Nigeria are established by the Federal Polytechnics Act of 1979 which is believed to have become defective in the course of time. The migration of lecturers and staff from polytechnics to university will also stop because whatever you are going to benefit from university education, they are also available uh, within the polytechnic system. Perhaps if the Polytechnic Act is worked on in line with the current reality the world over, which is more concerned about technological innovation and advancement, the graduates of Polytechnics in Nigeria will be able to compete favorably with their counterparts from similar institutions. All right, um, quite interesting, you know, the offshoot from there. And I particularly liked what the man said. Back in the day when he went to school, the university, the polytechnic, there were just 20 in his class. And for the same course, the same school, there are over 200. I'm kind of alarmed. They are actually, I think he said 2,000 or so. It's, it, it's, it's quite alarming. How much can a lecturer do with that number? I mean, perhaps they have to share the classes. I don't know. We have somebody who will be joining us later in the course of our discussion and uh, some of his uh, questions and postulations. He will handle it for me. But about now, we are going to Lagos to look at one of the oldest, you know, polytechnics in Nigeria. Actually, it was founded in 1947, and then he was known. It was known as uh, Yaba College of Technology. But as of today, he popularly call it Yaba Tech. It has produced a lot of very important Nigerians. But I'm wondering, is it still maintaining the core mandate? Let's find out together. Polytechnic education is considered the solid foundation of national development as it has all that is required to strengthen the economy of a nation. Howbeit, Polytechnic in Nigeria is believed to have deviated from their core mandate of producing graduates with the technical know-how and expertise in other sectors of education, such as humanities. Has this mandate changed? Polytechnic education is to train middle, high middle level manpower resources students that can go out there to meet the basic needs of the economy, whether in the factory, in the industries, in the, every other places. They are the ones who train them to be able to use their hand to acquire skill, not just theory. They must apply it right here in the school before going out there. So for development in society, in the economy generally, all aspects of the economy, we train students. We train them to be able to apply the knowledge directly, immediately, quickly. Here you talk of uh, engineering, marine technology, uh, 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 whichever kind of engineering. Apart from this, students have been finding it difficult to relate with the reality of what we are teaching them. The mandate of polytechnic education is to produce students who are well equipped with technical and entrepreneurial skills that will help develop the economy of a nation. Over the years, 10 years or more, we know there have been a gradual reduction in the effort, in the effort of the lecturers. And the output that we give out, it is a fact like that. But it is not sufficient to say that we have deviated. What led to the deviation is some of what I have said. Insufficient fund, lack of facilities that will improve and aid the students in understanding and meeting up with the societal needs. So these things are not available, but efforts have been made. We go as far as personal contribution of lecturers, of even the institutions like Yabatek, to a large extent. So many things have been added. Amidst the challenges that makes this tough to achieve, why has the Polytechnic Institution not been able to produce any scientific research for the growth and development of Nigeria? Our mandate, so to say, is not only to train these students, but to be science-oriented so that they can bring us models of what we are teaching them to be able to link it to the development of the country. We have been doing that, and tremendously so many potentially have done so many things. It needs a lot of funding and assistance from government, from the polytechnics themselves, to assist the students who have an idea, that have a model, 
to assist them. They have got down three, four, five of them sometimes. Sit down to bring out a model of a particular thing or a process through which a particular job can be done or some other products that can be used in lieu of what we knew, what we know as raw materials presently. So it is to a large extent scientific research are going on and modeling, producing prototypes is being is going on tremendously. It is believed that if the challenges faced by the Nigerian Polytechnic could be surmounted, then there would be great advancement in technology that will aid rapid development that will strengthen the nation. All right, um, you have a take there, and they will believe that tomorrow will be better than today. And uh, speaking about the tomorrow being better than today, it depends on what we are laying on the grounds as we speak. We're doing our own beats here to scream, to talk until we find changes, you know, being reflected on the segments we always call out from. And um, today we're talking about the strengthening of tertiary institution. Polytechnic is on the focus. It's actually on my table. And the man at the helm of affairs is right here with me. To answer some of those questions we're discussing, please, I will be uh, saying hello and welcome to Professor Idris Bugaji, the Executive Secretary, uh, the National Board for Technical Education here in Nigeria. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, viewers. Good morning. Uh, I must say, oh, sorry, we drag you out, but then that's the passion. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> now, we've been that's looking right. at the core mandate <clears throat> of uh, the polytechnics and the technical education here in Nigeria. Are we still following it? I know that um, one of the main objectives when it was um, established was uh, to promote the technical vocational education and training. Uh, you know, technology transfer as well as skill development in yeah. our socioeconomic uh, uh, environment here in Nigeria. Are we still pursuing that objective? Well, to a large extent, we are doing our best to deliver on those objectives. But there are so many challenges. When you took, look at the Tibet sector, technical vocational education and training sector, we have two major tracks. Technical education track, which produces diploma, higher national diploma holders, and vocational education that, that deals with hands-on skills. And we have the Nigerian Skills Qualification Framework to guide us. Mm -hmm. So there are so many challenges in the system. The challenges of you know poor funding, the challenges of lack of proper recognition and uh, reward, and uh, several others. And uh, but we are we are, we, are, we are stemming the tide. We are getting over those challenges gradually. Government is realizing the value of technical and vocational education. Government is also trying to support. Just last week we had a meeting with the uh, of the national Nigerian skill uh, national skill national council on skills, okay. chaired by Mr. Vice President. And they were, the meeting was, the vice president was so passionate about it that he said, let us meet, meet in another two weeks mm. in order to resolve the outstanding issue. So I think government is determined to see that the, the, the skills training program are repositioned. And uh, so many challenges, but I think they are not insurmountable. You know, uh, the polytechnics is, uh, for me, a place where we shouldn't find certain courses, you know, being... Um, Taught yes. and uh, certificates awarded for them as well. But we, it's not, um, uh, you know, unknown as mm. today that we find courses like uh, perhaps banking and finance, mm. uh, political, uh, you know, uh, admi whatever. all those things, business mm. administration mm. and uh, English language being taught in political in politics. Yes. I mean, is that the right thing to do? And what is your board doing to ensure that this does not get to happen yeah. anymore? Well, for every polytechnic, we ensure that 70% of the courses taught are from the core science, engineering, and technology mandates. The remaining 30% can be in other areas. Because even students of these engineering courses need to have some understanding of management, finance, etc., etc. So we sometimes allow those other courses to run because even the engineering courses, uh, you know, students may have to go and take courses in these other programs. So, but the issue is we maintain a 70-30 really ratio. So 70% of all the courses in any polytechnic must be science and engineering based. The remaining 30 can be in other non-science areas because we need each other. But uh, the focus has always been on 
technology you know programs and uh, for that reason uh, we, we we ensure that every polytechnic meets th those requirements so uh, i think we just need to refocus those programs because a lot of those programs that we are even you know delivering today are out of date our curriculum is over 20 some of them are over 20 years old the industrial equip, you know, equipment being used in, in the industries uh, are already, you know, mechatronics, mm -hmm. you know, con controlled by computers, mm -hmm. what they call computer-aided manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And all those things are not there in our curriculum. Definitely. So that's what we are trying to do now. I would like to know, are you making efforts to tell them to open up this, not to give certificates, mm -hmm. you know, or training, mm -hmm. but to work for the community, mm -hmm. you know, when they need it and they collect a pay? Yeah. That way, we stop screaming about money. Yeah. I'm sure there will be a time they'll be able to get money and be able to pay back. Yeah, surely. Mm -hmm. If, if, if polytechnics can go into skills training, it will even allow them to do services in order to generate revenue. For example, if you train your students in autotronics, how to check, diagnose your vehicle, and determine the faults, and take appropriate corrective measures. You teach your students, people from the staff and other people from outside will be bringing their vehicles for, 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 for you know, auto training checks. And that way you can re generate revenue. We are also trying to encourage them to engage the informal sector. Every polytechnic should look around and see what are the informal sectors around it. If you go to Aba, you have the Araria market. If you go to Pant Kaduna, you have the Panteka. If you go to Kano, you have Kofarua. If you go to any city, you'll find an informal set setup. Here you have the Apo village in here in Abuja. Yeah. So the polytechnics should engage those informal sectors so that they can benefit each other. Mm -hmm. Benefit each other in the sense that some of their students can even go there for well, hands-on skills yes. training. Mm -hmm. At the same time, those people doing the hands-on outside the, the polytechnic can also come into the polytechnic and understand a little bit of the theories behind the practice they are doing. So this is the, a, a kind of win-win situation for all. Mm -hmm. So we are encouraging that, and it's going to also enhance the IGR because this is a major issue now, especially with the dwindling resources given in the budget. So uh, politicians must sit up to improve on their IGR. I think I like that bit because you can actually go there, bring in mm -hmm. the people that know the techniques yes. but uh, are not uh, certificated, mm -hmm. and um, they decide to come in and share their experiences, yes. challenges, mm -hmm. in and the crude form with mm -hmm. which they you know navigate it. Mm -hmm. It could actually help the students. Yes. But then let's go out there and uh, take a bit of vox pop views from the streets and when we come back whatever the um the output is from the people we'll discuss it All let's right. go there thank you we still have the right sounds very much of your children so, to my house. i would just say invest is just like just a name yes because if you want to compare compare the both. If you're talking about re-teaching or if you want to, those people that pass through real learning is those ones from the Polytechnic. The disparity between university graduates and the Polytechnic graduates, well, uh, both of them are graduates. They are more thorough in terms of, uh, of the study. Why, why that or Polytechnic? You know, they, I know that they do a kind of two years for diploma after which they will go back for another two years or four years for for HND. But a university graduate, by the time they have that BSc, they have an edge all over polytechnic graduates and even those that go for NCE outside there. And whenever they apply in any places, they can work, they have an edge too, they can also give them, they can easily give them job because of the kind of training they have passed through while they're in school. The disparity depends on the law of Nigeria. Of recent, the House of the Senate, they have met that there should be no disparity in terms of whoever graduated from polytechnic or university. I think this shouldn't be our problem in Nigeria. Our problem should be based on performances. And we should not go back to the drawing board and talk about how people's performances will affect their take home. The more you contribute, the more you have to take home. That is what we promote our performances or our growth in Nigeria. But when we depend on who has this certificate, who has this, who has this, there are people with a degree, BXC, that cannot defend this. Why we have people with HND, ND, not even HND, that can defend it very well. University graduates have their parts to play. 
in the same manner as polytechnics that we have uh, their roles to play. There ought really not to be a uh, competition among them because the aim of the polytechnic education is also very, very sound and gives you that desire to use your hand to do, to do things a lot. While uh, for me, I'll say the university education consists more of uh, research, uh, uh, writing. But today, say somebody is an university graduate, you give him level eight. Then somebody is a polytechnic graduate, you give him level seven. And the level, the graduate, you make him grow, he goes to become a director, while the polytechnic person will not become a director. I don't know what it is now, but this used to be the case, and this is frustration. They will say it, but is it equal? Now you see, there's difference between statement and implementation. Is it currently being implemented? We still have the right. So some people are still communicating and somebody says, uh, I like this program. I suggest the use of aptitude test during employment and uh, promotion as well. And uh, one more person. I'm watching your program. Okay, let's see. Uh, Honorable Nathaniel says, Professor Idris is a sincere person. Please tell the government not to discriminate between all tertiary education in the country. Let them start with the TED fund disbursement to all tertiary institutions because you're laughing. <laughs> yes. He says the universities see it as your birthright. Mm. And um, okay, so why did you laugh? Well, well, the reason is simply because that would be a very big fight with ASU, <laughs> the University of ASU, <laughs> because ASU actually started this issue of TED fund. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have already, you know, it's there in the act mm. that they will get twice what the polytechnics will get. Okay. So for that reason, I have advised our own uh, Polytechnic Academic Staff Union and other unions also mm -hmm. to bring out something new, something innovative, something that they can be able now to fight for. For example, why don't we set up a national skills fund? Okay. So that polytechnics can now get an additional funding from the national skills fund so that they can now do hands-on skills training of their students. The staff can also get, go and get industrial attachments in industries to, to add value you know, to the way they are delivering their courses. So these are areas that we need to look at, you know, new areas of bringing more funding, more training for both the lecturers and students. The, the guy who said we need an aptitude before recruitment, well, let me mention that Polytechnics in the last five years have not been able to replace outgoing staff. Many Polytechnics, the head of service has refused to give them waiver wow. to recruit staff who had either retired, died, or left the service. Oh. So if you go to a department, half of the you know lecturers had already gone, hmm. and there is no way we, you know they, they can be replaced because the government has said no new recruitment, and we are not asking for a new recruitment. We are saying let them allow us to replace those who have already gone. We okay. have made our it's point not, to our not minister. new recruitment, have, it's new replacement. New replacements. Okay. And uh, the issue is when the replacements come, you know, you you receive letters from all over the top echelon of government that they have candidates they are, they, you know, they, they, they are proposing. And that you end up with recruiting, you know, if you want to use those criteria, you can mm. hardly get 50%. <laughs> the, the, the first few are already gone, you know, to, to, to this unfortunate, uh, you know, Nigerian factor. Right. So, so I think we need to do a lot in that area. And I <laughs> hope the head of service will help us allow Polytechnics to replace outgoing staff. All right, Professor Idris, there's a lot of passion. As you talk, thank you. I feel it. <laughs> thank you. And I just want to say thank you for yeah. coming on the show. And I want to believe with the way you talk that um, a whole lot will be happening real soon. I look forward to what you said will be happening from next year. Yeah. I would want to drive into a polytechnic yeah. and repair my car Great. when it gets bad Great. without Great. going to a poor village. Exactly. All right. So we'll be speaking with the executive secretary, National Board for Education, or for Technical Education here in Nigeria, the person of Professor Idris Bukaji and um, it's nice having on the show for now we'll take a break don't go away All right, uh, show is Weekend Deal, and uh, I have another person just joining me. I'll quickly introduce her. She is uh, Honorable Rosemary Ojochomimi Osikoya and uh, she'll be speaking on strengthening our tertiary institution. I want to start by saying welcome. Thank 
your, t- I don't know which school you went to, but in retrospect, in, in a throwback, and uh, now, what do you think is right with our special institutions? Well, I went to University of Joss for my first and second degree. I have also been privileged to attend University of Lorraine for postgraduate diploma in education. Uh, but then I would like to compare that with the University of Wales, where I had a postgraduate diploma in project. Uh, you're going to score me zero now. <laughs> <laughs> you're just going to score zero now. You see problem. So, so I've had the opportunity <laughs> possibly of comparing these several. three very several mm. uh, different organizations. And then I could tell you that the teaching methodologies are different. I could tell you that uh, the expectation of the students and the workload you have to do to acquire your degree are very different. Mm. But I think the one that impressed me the more was I thought that for master's degree, that my professor at the University of Georgia, Professor Victor Adetula, was tough because mm. everybody thought he was tough. But when I had to go through University of Wales, I realized I hadn't started with mm. my Nigerian background mm. of education, that you are required to do almost everything, 10 times the more you have to do. There was emphasis on your capacity to think, your critical rational reasoning as a person. Um, your work are more vetted because plagiarism became a new concept to me. In Nigeria, you could copy and paste and join everything and you know, you could get away with it. But I realized in the University of Wales, ordinary assignments, you have to think a lot more different. So I think I was privileged to have that international learning exposure. It redefines and changed my life. So about that for technical tertiary, tertiary education, so to speak. And then back to the question of uh, vocational education and training. Um, my concept again is a bit re- defined. Mm. Conceptually, you ask what are the basic needs of man? The basic needs of man is food, clothing, and shelter. Thank you. And that is actually what bothers you in the whole essence of how you live, what you live, without knowing whether it is produced in Niger or produced um, in Canada or United States. Basically, you just need your functional needs to be met. And you need people in every areas of that occupational area that affects your life. You need plumbers, you need bakers, Ah. you need uh, Ah. tailors, you need all of that. So you find that for every organization, uh, for every country, don't even stop at national level like we always try to do. For the community where you live to be functional for you and to meet your need of survival as a human being, you need all the occupational skills around you to work. And that, interestingly, is that what brings us to the domain of technical vocational education and training. And then we are talking about the systematic supports that you receive to be for in terms of the knowledge the skills and the competencies for you to function in every occupational area of your life mm. and so at that point for us to now talk about that every of us can relate to that okay. in your local community who is the baker how far do you have to travel and then if you are now comparing the different communities we are talking about mm-hmm. let me start from just where I mentioned, mm. go back to Kogi State, where I am from, and pick any Nigerian city. And then compare that with what you find abroad. For instance, go to United Kingdom, go to Wales. In every community where you are, are you able to assess your basic needs of life without having to travel far? Thank you. How many people around you within that community? You remember in the time of old, every Nigerian community was self sustained. You have your local hunters with you. You have your local farmers with you. And then you have all of that. So every community strives to be able to so provide for itself. So strengthening technical vocational like education and training is no longer the esocentric thing we talked about. Everybody has to have a posh degree and all of that. But it actually touches on our survival as a people. You know what you say, um, it, 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 it goes a whole lot to expose what happens in a lot of industry. I've uh, seen a medical doctor who was made to read medicine by the parents. She's actually good, but she has a passion for baking and she owns one of the most beautiful bakeries in Port Harcourt. Oh, we know Fowles who likes music, say go study law. He did that and he came back. So it's important that um, we build around our skills, you know, around our talents, what we have. And then speaking of that, I know that uh, you were uh, at a point in your life, the Commissioner for Education, Science and Technology in Kogi State, am I right? Yes. Mm-hmm. I watched you on TV. All right, and I'm wondering, 
with that position, you should be able to tell me what our problem is. Why can't we move? Why can't we take a giant step? Why can't we just jump up and achieve it? You've gone to Wales, you've been to Jaws, you've been to Ilori. <laughs> what can we not do right? First, I would like to tell you that uh, as a state commissioner, let me start from what is the role of the state governments. Uh, the Nigerian responsibility, Nigeria's responsibility for education is co-shared between the federal government and then the 36 states and the FCT. So you'll find that uh, education therefore becomes everybody's own. Education is one of what is mentioned in the Nigerian constitution, just to bring everybody up to space, that it is the fundamental rights of a child to be educated. And so when you begin to see the strata of education, to play background, so everybody understands, because the average person seems not to understand a bit of what is interesting and what is the role of each of these entities. Basic education by Nigeria's constitution is the responsibility of the local government areas. Now, so when you say that at that level, then to a broadly extent, you find that the secondary education is broadly the responsibility of state governments. And then when you get into tertiary education, you would find that it is the responsibility of the federal government. A lot of people understand it like that. But until recently, you know, until 2021... But why do we have state-owned universities? And okay, so we are getting to that. Okay. In 2021, you find that Nigeria went through a very significant shift you find that federal government gives support to basic education. The UBEC, the Universal Basic Education Commission, is there, and then at the Fed, at the tertiary education, the Nigerian University Commission is there. And so the secondary education was offered because it was termed the problem of the state government. And so government was not directly providing funding, but federal government on the other side set up the federal unity college system, such that you have models. The federal unity colleges are to be models for states to copy from on how it should be done. But something very significant happened in 2021. Nigerians set up the National Senior Secondary Education Commission. Oh. And so at that point, you find there seemed to be that balance at the federal level. But with this co-shared responsibility you have, what does the national policy say? The national policy, again, in, 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 align, and, uh, in just to buttress on that again, means the management of education, as you have that. So as a state commissioner, you sit in with the minister for education at that level, and all of us co shared formulate policies for the education sector, leverage on what should be the next steps. And that brings about the National Council on Education, one just held last week. And so at that point, as a state commissioner, you are expected to domesticate and ensure the implementation of the federal policies at the level of your state. What should be the curricula? What should be, again, the access, uh, the connection between industries as well as technical colleges? Because the policy I heard you were talking with Prof. Mm. The national policy of education says that every technical vocational um, institution in Nigeria should have a vocational, a production unit. Okay. So by policy, you find that every school is supposed to be able to provide direct services to their communities. That's, that's just what I, I needed to uh, have done because we need it. It will, it will elevate a lot of uh, quackery when it comes to repairs, maintenance and all of that in our homes. But let me hold you there and uh, play a little bit, a shift in the political, you know, uh, in the politics, uh, uh, polytechnic education is our focus. The reason is a lot of polytechnics are trying to get rebaptized, you know, to become universities. I don't know why, but you answer it, but that will be after Onyola has uh, told us a bit about it. Let's join her. Polytechnic education in Nigeria was established to train technologists, technicians, craftsmen, and provide low, middle, and higher level technical manpower for national development, leading to the awards of ordinary national diploma and higher national diploma certificates. Polytechnics were set up in a bid to address Nigeria's skilled manpower gap and set up Nigeria on a sound footing for technological advancement. However, there seems to have been a shift in the focus of the mandate, establishing polytechnics in Nigeria. We do practicals at least two times or three times in a week. I can actually make a chip, which I can put on any part of my phone, and then all my network bars will go down until that chip is being removed. I work with the playout center, which we collect signal from dump sites and then send them to star times for the viewers at all. They are doing well. 
especially those ones that wanted to learn. There are various categories of students. So you should not take the other category to be a measured criteria on all police students. Uh, for instance, in my own department, before our students graduate, some of them become chartered accountants. So you cannot say the technical skill is on the low ebb. But for some of them, and that is general all over the world. We shouldn't be having problem with power supply if we have the stakeholders in the industry, in the business world, the corporate world, coming to partner with Polytechnics to fund experimental researches on solar energy, for instance. What we need is collaboration, public-private initiative. The government has got its own role. If uh, they are not coming to us, we also owe it a responsibility to go to them. The situation is worrisome to the effect that if you need a very skilled plumber, mason, or artisan, one would have to travel to the neighboring countries of Togo and Benin Republic to get them. Some stakeholders in the educational sector have attributed the dearth of skilled workers to a number of factors. A lot of products that have passed through the polytechnic system, because they are trying to respond to the stimulus of stigmatization, the potential limitations they are bound to face in the pursuit of their career, many of them are streaming into the university educational system needlessly. Whereas the Asian Tigers, other countries of the world that are really making waves in technological advance, advancement, they are prioritizing pragmatic vocational and technical education. The government policy aspect that has affected the polytechnic, apart from funding, is the segregation between the polytechnic students and the university students. For instance, for the entry level, government will say if you score above 200 pass mark in jump, you go to the university. Where, and the polytechnic, they have a cutoff point of 150. So it means that even with that policy alone, they have relegated polytechnics to be a substandard school. This is the age where our polytechnic system should configure and reconfigure the curriculum, the pedagogy of the delivery of the curriculum of our respective courses, relevant courses, to capture current realities that are determining where the world moves development-wise. Analysts have advocated for a review of the mandate establishing the polytechnic system and a review of the curriculum in tandem with the demands of the fast-changing world. All right, so uh, while that was going on, we've been busy sharing our views between me and Honorable Rosemary Osok uh, Osikoya, yes. And um, she's been very uh, laudable with her you know, thoughts on uh, political education, uh, 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 polytechnic education, sorry, and the technical education as well. And um, I would like to know, really, if you're building in Nigeria, a lot of buildings, even in our villages, go there. We see the foreigners, Kotonu boys, doing all the... In fact, it's so much so that even the POP ceiling now, we call it Kotonu ceiling, you know, to a large extent. Is it that we don't have people within the university, not university now, polytechnics, who can really, you know, train people to do that? Why are we moving away from our core mandates? Um, very interesting. It brings us to the question of access. And then I was asking you a question off camera. I said, why should a child aspire to go to a particular institution and not the other? And then it brings us to the question of incentive, the matter of reward, and um, the issue of stigma. Um, if everybody wants their child to have the best of access, and somewhere along the line you find that there's no much reward 
in doing there. And Nigerians, you will say, why would I want to suffer and my children would suffer? Then it brings us to the governance structure. Because everywhere across in the world, you find that, uh, why would I want to be a teacher, for crying out loud? Why should I go for techno um, technical education if everybody in Nigeria is having this culture of I have to be a sheikh in my own domain? Everyone who works in menial labor is, uh, is a dropout. It's only, I remember when I was in secondary school, they would tell you that the best of brains should go to the sciences. And then those who don't seem to be doing well should go to the arts and the humanities. And so, but nobody asked me what I wanted to be. So I drafted, I was drafted into the sciences because I was smart, in quotes. And then by the time I got into the A-levels, we're having conversation and everybody thought I was a lawyer because they thought I speak so very well. And then I articulate my issues better. And then I, I, for the first time I wanted to know, so what is it about being a lawyer? Now, there's, for some of us, you know, um, let me start with what the law says before we say, why should I go to a polytechnic? How much of sensitization, enlightenment, and understanding, and how uh, do we have the average student who wants to go through an occupational path? I just told you, technical, vocational, and education. It's about strengthening individuals in certain areas of skills, mm -hmm. competencies, and then knowledge that makes them able to provide essential service in every occupational area. If you pick Finland, which is said to be having one of the best education in the world, and many other countries have told that line, you look at your needs as a society. And from when children are coming from basic education, you begin to study them to see what are their flaws, what are their areas of competencies, where would they do well? And so you first map out who should be where because mm -hmm. everybody should contribute to the society. Guidance and counseling. So if I have a flair, for psychomotor skills. Mm -hmm. I connect my head with my brain. Some children are just so talented. They can create everything out of nothing. Mm -hmm. But you see, at what time would a parent now say, I don't want to suffer in my old age? So you, you cannot be an engineer. You have to go and become a lawyer, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. You have to be a doctor. So one of the evidence of this poor guidance counseling mm -hmm. and this poor mapping of skills of individuals you see today is this case of this person is already a medical doctor. And the person is already practicing as a doctor, but no fulfillment. And the person wakes up one day and either wants to be a lawyer or the person suddenly wants to go and learn a trade. But again, let me say this again. It's not to say that because I want to be an accountant does not mean I should not have functional skills for livelihood. I, I would want to say thank you for coming on. I always know that each time you're on set, it's a hot, 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 hot. And I appreciate that, especially your passion for technical education. And so we've been speaking with Honorable Rosemary Ojo Hermini Osikoya. Thank you for coming on the show. Yes, University of Ibadan has resumed. We earlier saw the Polytechnic. The university has resumed. And I'm wondering, are the students having jet lag? after the long strike let's go join them in university of ibadan academic activities started with the resumption of the institution shops and business owners are back in business what has been the situation in the university community and lecture rooms we thank god now that the strike has ended and um, you can see i'm just coming from class we've started receiving lectures since morning 9 a.m. I'm just coming back, 6 p.m. Normalcy has um, resumed back on campus and everything is taking shape as before. So um, I'm happy now. It's nice actually. The lecturers have been considerate. They are coming to the class, we are going to normal, normal. I think with that, we are going to be back to the normal position back. So I hope we won't have anything like strike again. We really thank God for the suspension of the uh, ASU strike. In fact, the day we had the news, the parents were rejoicing. The students also were rejoicing. That joy is so much, we don't even think of what has happened again. But the only thing that we are begging government and the ASU is to take solid agreement this time around. In my work, things have started. Uh, work has started actually. Um, there are many students uh, that have come back and uh, we're happy to have them back. The lecturers are happy, the students are happy. Uh, one looks forward to uh, having the uh, pledges or the promises.
the government made to be fulfilled and that we um, balance up uh, the joy, the happiness uh, of redemption. So we hope that uh, that will come uh, very soon. Since our resumption, uh, we have noticed uh, the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. The problem is not, is not beyond redemption. What one would advise is for the government to take us to demand more seriously, uh, look more critically into, into the demands, and then begin to respond to this humble demand of ASU. In every community, academics inclusive, the roles supporting services play cannot be overemphasized. Majority of shop owners and transporters and campus that were badly affected with the absence of the student during the elongated strike are now very happy to have them back on campus. Before the strike ended, Mm -hmm. There is a lot of problem because we couldn't sell, we used to sleep, so everything just turned upside down. But now, we thank God, everything has been improved, little by little. When there was strike, with the operators here, we find it a bit difficult, not even a bit difficult, it was so terrible. You know, early can you go with? 2,000 era, 3,000 era, and then considering the amount you used to maintain your car. But now, you can say everybody is happy. Agbowo, one of the areas around University of Ibadan, where majority of students that stay off campus reside, is bubbling with their activities, but with the reservation of payment of accumulated house rents. Actually, unfortunately for most of us, our school just resumed a new session when the strike happened. So most of the students here that couldn't stay on the school campus went out to get a room or get an apartment of their own around February and that was when the strike actually happened. So most of us were away from the house for like nine months. Somebody like me, when I came back, I just have like four months to the end of my rent. So I just have to pay. By February now, our agent, the landlord is expecting us to renew our rent. As every individual is counting his or her losses, because of the negative impacts of this concluded as a strike. It will be more appreciated if lecturers and all arms of government work together as partners in progress in order to avoid a future occurrence of ASU strike in our nation. My name is Elizabeth Abai and uh, next week we'll bring you another exciting issue, believing that will cause that positive change in the society. For now, be good citizens, keep your hands busy. Bye.